Right, so uh, I, I think I've been given a very broad mandate actually talking to you about AI powered uh, pseudo CT image synthesis from uh, magnetic resonance imaging. And I, I feel that this is a sufficiently broad to a topic. I can probably talk about this the whole day. So um, this is probably going to be one of um, these talks where we sort of have sections. We go a little into detail. In other sections, we <coughs> sort of skip over. So just help to allow some time for questions if uh, anything is missing from anybody's expectations. So let's, let's get started here. So. Um, uh, we have the obligation, actually, in our institution to disclose any financial interests, and they have nothing to disclose here. But just wanted to acknowledge, actually, this uh, European project called Provision. It's, it's kind of uh, instrumentation-related uh, uh, thing. So uh, the, the aim is to design a PET scanner dedicated for our high-resolution, temporal and space resolution, a PET scanner dedicated for prostate cancer imaging. And uh, this is a collaboration with the... Uh, spin-off from CERN called Provision. And uh, so you can see the device actually which is being tested in our facility. And this is one of the physicists actually operating the scanner. And some of the work that I'm going to present today is uh, linked to this project and obviously funded by, uh, by this project. So why, why do we need actually synthetic CG? So the first is that there are a number of scenarios actually in the clinical setting which require uh, to avoid actually doing an MRI scan, doing a CT scan in addition to uh, an MR, just to quickly through this. So the MR or PET MR only treatment planning is a typical application. And uh, the idea is to take advantage of the high soft tissue contrast provided by magnetic resonance imaging. There is no exposure, as you know, compared to CT, which is especially important, especially for the pediatric population. And then it eliminates also all the hurdles or the problems that we face with the uh, non-rigid uh, uh, alignments or registration between MRI and X-ray CG. Number of issues, actually financial issues, like to the cost workflow, it, it gets much, much simplified. And it's especially important for adaptive radiotherapy, where based basically on compound CT or magnetic resonance uh, imaging, where we don't have access directly to CT, and the CT prov provides the electron density which is needed for radiation dose calculation, for instance. Uh, a concept actually that I learned from the literature called simulation emitted radiation therapy, because I'm. Merci. Uh, I come from the uh, nuclear medicine field, and uh, this is uh, something that we got used to actually in the collaboration that we have with the radiation uh, oncology department. And something which is obviously closer to my heart is uh, PET MRI. And uh, again, so we need uh, to generate kind of attenuation map that we can use for attenuation correction purposes. So this is the problem can be summarized actually in this uh, slide here. Uh, what you see, the X-ray CG, which can be used actually to derive what we call an attenuation map uh, in terms of linear attenuation coefficients at 511 kV. And it's much, much problematic actually when we use the MR intensities because there is no direct correlation between the MR intensities, which are obviously correlated with T1, T2 relaxation times and proton density, and there is no direct link actually between the MRI and the and the city house field units or the um, electron density. And the problem gets more and more complicated for PET MRI because we usually ignore bony structures. I'm going to show you some examples. The MRI hardware shows it's very difficult to take this into account. Truncation issues, susceptibility, and a number of uh, other problems like motion and, and, and so on. So why uh, the generation of synthetic CG, so uh, especially when used deep learning based techniques can be used for three main applications. I'm going to focus on the f two, the first and this is the last one, and, and, and try to just mention the second application. So the first is to replace CT and MRI based treatment planning. Again, PET MR or treatment planning is it's the same. Uh, same kind of, uh, of, of thing, then derive the attenuation maps, as I mentioned, for the correction of PET, uh, CT, uh, PET MRI. Uh, so that, this is the typical workflow, actually, that we face for CT plus MR. So we acquire CT, we acquire the MR, and then we face this major problem, which requires the co-registration between the MRI and the CT. And then we proceed to the lineation of the regions of interest, the volume treatment volumes, and also the organs of interest, and then we proceed to the those calculations. So one of the problems that we face during the registration process is that with the temporal 
variability between the CT and MRI acquisition, which usually doesn't take uh, place actually during the same day. You see here a couple of examples here. Even if we can easily delineate the, uh, I think you see the mouse here. No, you don't see the mouse for some reason anyway. So you can easily delineate actually the um, uh, rectum and the bladder on the CT. Uh, we, we, which is good, but uh, the, the, uh, it's very difficult to keep consistent actually the bladder and the rectum filling. And the same takes place also for the uh, GI tracts where you have the stomach and the bowel. And again, it's very difficult to uh, keep any consistent uh, the, uh, the filling of the stomach and the bowel because of the temporal variability owing to the fact that the two scans are not acquired during the same day. Uh, so uh, the MDs are usually not very happy with these inconsistencies and one of the, the, issue, one of the solutions to this problem is to move from MR plus CT to MRI only radiation therapy treatment planning as you see in this scheme here. And obviously so the major problem that I'm going to address today very quickly is how to synthesize a uh, pseudo CT image from the acquired MRI scan. Uh, right, so the pros of moving from CT plus MR to MR only radiotherapy is summarized here. So basically, as I mentioned in the beginning, you reduce the uncertainty due to misregistration. You deal very well actually with the workflow. You uh, reduce the operational costs. You make it much, much easier actually for the staff and also for the patients. You reduce the radiation dose against, as I mentioned, and this is very helpful as well for MR LINAC guided radiation therapy, and I just took those illustrations here from the recent reports published by the ICRU focusing on the dose imagery for MR LINACs. You see there are at least three vendors providing these MR LINACs. Uh, so the first one is the ELECTA, and then you have also the um, uh, view ray for the advent of uh, PET MRI. So we're interested to do this for the brain. So we first align the PET with the patient's bed, and this is the MR-based technique. And you see that it matches actually very nicely the, uh, the uh, transmission-based technique. Um, more recently, so some of the manufacturers actually focused on developing special MR sequences which depict the bony structures because in the conventional T1, T2 weighted sequences, there is a kind of ambiguity between air and bony structures. It's very difficult to distinguish them. And those ultra short echo and zero time echo sequences enable you to, to, to nicely depict the bony structures. So you can easily actually synthesize a pseudo CT image from the acquired MR. And uh, this is a nice illustration from this uh, recent review paper. We see some different industrial solutions, I would say, so mostly from GE. And you see that basically for the same patients, so this is the X-ray CT, and the attenuation maps generated from the zero time echo, the ultra short echo, and uh, also the, um, the Dixon sequence. So very nice actually work, which is now being integrated into the clinical setting, right? So the Atlas based technique is a more powerful technique, and uh, I had one of my PhD students actually spent a lot of work developing, developing, developing different algorithms belonging to this class, and this is basically how the algorithm operates. So we've got a bunch of gorgeous red CG and MR atlases, and then you start with the incoming MRI from the patients, and you decomplex the formable registration with the atlas, so it takes a lot of time, obviously, and then you do kind of regression analysis to synthesize the patient-specific pseudo CG. Uh, the other category is what we call MLLA, or maximum likelihood reconstruction of uh, attenuation activity maps. So this is a very complex process that takes advantage of the high temporal resolution that we have on the commercial uh, PET scanners and uh, provides actually a solution which unfortunately is, is not unique in the sense that uh, you have a scaling factor uh, which is difficult uh, to implement and the, the uh, generated attenuation maps using this kind of technique is, are very uh, are noisy as you can see. So this is the conventional MLLA. You see it's very noisy and suffers actually from cross-talk between attenuation and activity maps. And then we did some developments as well to develop kind of uh, a priori knowledge that can be incorporated and forced in the form of penalty functions, or quadratic penalty functions, to improve the performance of the MLA estimates and see that the produced attenuation maps are less noisy. 
Uh, another technique which has been used as a clinical setting in the context of MRI guided uh, treatment planning is the direct conversion or classification, like this one actually proposed by Cohen. Again, so it relies on multiple well aligned pairs of uh, CT and MRI scans, and the only difference is the way to do the conversion, right? So there are multiple statistical based techniques, regression, also some techniques that use multiple MR sequences. And this technique actually is used actually for kind of polynomial conversion uh, based technique, and it, it really does a very good job in this respect. So deep learning techniques have uh, emerged uh, more uh, recently, and you see how realistic actually the pseudo CT image can be generated from the MR without this intermediate step, which uh, CT, you see nicely here the nasal cavities and the skull, which is extremely well predicted by the uh, deep, uh, deep learning model. So we did some work actually in, uh, a few years ago, actually with the radiation ecology to uh, generate attenuation, uh, to generate actually pseudo CT images using the atlas based techniques that I mentioned previously. And uh, this paper actually published by ELECTA in uh, 2017, triggered our attention, so we decided actually to go for comparative analysis of the number of bunch of techniques reported in literature compared to the deep learning model based model. And you see that we're not surprised by the conclusion, in the sense that the deep learning model actually outperformed all the conventional uh, atlas based techniques. Actually, going through the recent literature, there are a couple of review papers. The first focus on an MRI guided radiation uh, oncology, and the second in MR guided attenuation correction for PET MRI. You see that the increasing number of papers reported in the literature covering different anatomical structures for radiation therapy. You see an exponential increase in number of deep learning models that have been published uh, recently. So the model actually is um, you've got obviously the supervised and unsupervised way of training the, the model in the supervised uh, model. So you've got a bunch of uh, well-aligned MRI and CT uh, images that can be trained actually using a well-defined model. And then you've got the second step, which is the prediction step, where we kind of predict actually pseudo CT from the MRI without using actually the patient's uh, CT image. And uh, one of my PhD students developed actually the model that you see here. So there are two major components. We focus on the brain because it's more simple compared to the thorax and the uh, other regions in the body. Uh, one compartment actually does the segmentation and the second actually takes into account the synthesis. It's, it's a very complex model. I'm not going to discuss it because just for the sake of time. And you see basically here some of the um, results for one of the patients, well aligned with MRI and CG. And this is the sort of uh, CC generated by the deep learning model. Compared to the commercial uh, solution, you see major improvements, and this is also reflected in the in the bias maps, which are which are generated. Uh, you see that the commercial solution is is really very good cool approximation, right? We we can also use the same techniques not in the image domain but in the projection domain, and in this work we basically use the. Uh, sinograms both time of flight and non time of flight to train the network to predict directly what we call the attenuation correction factors in the projection domain. And uh, these are actually the uh, pseudo CT uh, images. You see that we depict the skulls, the nasal cavities. It's not perfect, but it really does a good job in this, in this respect. And these are the images, the best images corrected using the conventional, conventional approach versus the more sophisticated one that I presented here. Again, for the sake of time, let's go very quickly, actually. I would like really to keep it in 15 minutes. There are some commercial solutions. I'm not going to mention all of them, but we are we involved with in European projects with this company called Spectronic. Uh, they use actually also deep learning model using transfer function estimation algorithm, which does really a good job. You see some examples here. Uh, there is some debates in the literature which is the best metric to use actually to assess this um, uh, pseudo CT generation technique. So obviously some metrics are specific to the radiation ecology people, others specific for the nuclear medicine people. We're hoping actually to get kind of agreements um, during the next, uh, next few years on this. 
Now, in terms of bias maps, so if you look to the bias maps, so the error that can be committed in clinical CT when using CT-based attenuation correction versus MRI-based attenuation correction when using commercial solutions, so the bias can be very large, so between 20 and 30 percent, as you can see in this case. Now, in the radiation ecology field, we're talking about different energy ranges, right? And the differences can be uh, very small in this, in this context. You see the different pseudo CT images that can be generated using the different techniques. This is the water equivalent approach, which is used in clinical CT in a number of institutions that I know. So, for the KV that we have in position emission tomography, but if you zoom, on this, uh, those volume isograms, you see some differences here which are well documented. So the, the, the other application is obviously to generate the um, uh, digitally reconstructed radiographs which are used actually for patient setup and optimization and can be nicely generated also from the uh, pseudo CT images. So it really does, does, does a good job in this sense and have that within this 15 minutes, I convinced you actually of the role of deep learning to synthesize pseudo CT images. Uh, just to summarize very quickly, again, for the sake of time, so we, we can skip some of those conclusions. Uh, I think I convinced you that synthetic CT images generation is really crucial in situations where CT is not available, either radiation ecology or nuclear medicine applications. And the key component, the key here, issue here is the acquisition time for MRI, which tends to be very, uh, very lengthy. And I have one of my PhD students spent six months in Stanford University in, in California working on this uh, neuromix um, uh, sequence. It's, it's really multi, multi contrast sequence evolving T1, T2. Uh, DWE and so on, it takes only two minutes, but the images are extremely noisy and he did some work actually to improve the performance actually, the, especially the quality of the images. You see here the, the neuromix, the conventional sequence, which is obviously takes factor of two, sec factor of 20, acquisition time compared to the neuromix protocol. And this is the deep learning model in the bias maps here. And obviously much, much improved the quality. And this is especially important in cases where you have patient motion. If you have a sequence that takes only two minutes, so you reduce significantly the motion of the patient and also does a good job for handling susceptibility artifacts. And I think the future of MRI is definitely going to go in this direction. Right, so with this, I thank you very much for your attention. And I thank also the funding bodies actually funding our research and my team here. And uh, especially uh, Hossein and uh, Isaac, who did some of the work that I presented here. And uh, also, twink to those who graduated this year. So, Isaac, um, Amir, and uh, Azada. So, they, had, uh, they done actually very good work and they presented their thesis uh, during this year. Thank you. And then I advertise also for this conference that will take place in Geneva next year. Hope to see some of you there. And I thank you again for your attention.